Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 92nd Street Y. It's quite amazing what passes for entertainment nowadays. Our children are fixated on wizards and werewolves and vampires. Adult movies are dominated by comic book characters. And channel surfing on television offers mostly the low tide of reality TV, which isn't the news and surely isn't art, but bizarrely features the, the Kardashians and the housewives from various cities and mob wives and people from the Jersey Shore. Who are these people? And all kinds of survivors, not from the Holocaust or any other genocide, or any, any genocide for God's sake, but fictional survivors passed off as if they are real. And the idol worshipers who watch American Idol, and the people with two left feet who wish they could trip over themselves like the has-beens on Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> In this coarsened culture of ours, it is easy, easy to forget what it means to be truly entertained, to be in the presence of art, and how high the standards should be before calling someone talented. Mandy Patinkin is talented, and he's real, and he's versatile, and he's always fun to watch, whether as the various complicated, emotionally complex characters he has portrayed on TV, Dr. Jeffrey Geiger from Chicago Hope, Oh, look at the hum, the murmurs. <laughs> hey, Mandy, you hearing that? Murmurs. Jason Gideon from Criminal Minds. <laughs> all right, where well, I just teed it up for you all. And most recently, Saul Berenson from Showtime's Homeland. And in films, he has at times been both mesmerizing and, and heartbreaking as Tata in Ragtime and Avigdor in Yentl. And even a fictional Julius Rosenberg in Daniel. And of course, there is his singing voice, that mysteriously ethereal falsetto, making magic with the Sondheim catalog most notably in Sunday in the Park with George. And because this is the 92nd Street Y, the YMHA, we note his own recordings and concerts, such as Mama Lotion, his record of Yiddish songs. But you know, he always seems to be on to the next thing, never staying too long, leaving his mark, and then like a wandering Jew, <laughs> off he goes again, as if his entire life has been, sent, has been spent searching for that elusive six-fingered man. Please welcome Mandy Patinkin. Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a little terrifying sitting backstage listening to all of that. You feel like <laughs> you're at your own funeral. <laughs> and yet you're alive. I'm alive, thank God. So, yes, we're all thankful for that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a bummer of a night. <laughs> so, Mandy, uh, I, I understand that this is actually your favorite film role. Is that correct? I've read this before. Is this your favorite role that you've ever performed, both film and television? Oh, God. I would, I would, uh, I w I w no, I'd never say that. I always hope the next, <clears throat> next thing I shoot will be my favorite thing. The next day that I get to be with an actor in front of a camera will be my favorite thing. If I thought that what it was was in the past, I'd, I would be lost. But a very interesting thing happens wherever you travel with, in connection with this film. Is that correct? Oh, yes, uh, I would say it's safe to say a day doesn't go by where someone of some age doesn't come up to me and asks me to say the line or offers me any number of lines from the film itself. So would you say the line? 
<laughs> you are among friends. Hello. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. <laughs> but may I share? Yes. May I share something with yes, you? Yes, please. It's do. interesting. A, a few years ago, I think four or five years ago, about four or five years ago, I was in Philadelphia. My wife and I were in the gym in the hotel, and I was getting ready to give birth to the newest version of what we call the Patty Mandy Show. And I was in the gym working out, and I don't have earphones because I run a concert, no matter what concert. I, I have like 10, 12 hours of material I have to keep reviewing. So when I'm on the pre-core elliptical trainer or the arc trainer, whatever I'm working on uh, elliptical-wise, uh, I run a concert. So I see on the TVs uh, is the Princess Bride is there. And I'm not paying attention to it because I got to get through the concert so that when I go on stage, if I screw up and mess up the words, it's not my fault. I went over it at the gym. <laughs> and I finish working out and I go up to the hotel room and my wife is, uh, dinner is there and, I, I, uh, and, and the Princess Bride is on in the hotel room and the sound's on because it wasn't on at the gym. And it's on right at the end of the movie. And it's years ago that I made this. And it's at this particular moment where I'm standing at the window with the man in black. And the character that I play says a line that I remembered saying, but I didn't remember hearing it when I made it. And the line was, I have been in the revenge business so long. Now that it's over, I do not know what to do with the rest of my life. And, and I looked at my wife and I said, boy, for me, that's the line of the movie. And it's never quoted by anyone. <laughs> but when I think of the uh, energy and all over the world that people spend with revenge to themselves, their families, their loved ones, their governments, their arguments with each other, it's so consuming and exhausting and such a waste of, of this second that we're here for. So I'm glad I heard it all those years later. <laughs> Will you want to hear something, audience? I have a new book coming out on revenge, and I use that line. Oh, very good. Yeah, I actually, yeah there, it, there's a section, and I talk about the ambivalence, the after, you know, if revenge is sweet, it has a bitter aftertaste, right? Because, yes. and Ingo Montoya tells us that. He says he doesn't actually know what to do with himself now yes. that he's devoted his entire life. So thank you for sharing that. You learned how to sword fight for yes. this. Is that true? That was that hard to do? That was a. It was uh, not hard. It was just a lot of work, and I loved it. Actually, um, one of the last nights of the Patty Mandy concert in New York, I had a moment of silence in the audience because Bob Anderson, who was the Olympic fencing coach, uh, Olympic champion in in Great Britain, that was our fencing coach for four months while we were shooting the Princess Bride in Europe in London. <clears throat> He died at 90, 89 or 90 years old that night. And uh, this was a beautiful man. So he trained me for four months uh, every day during lunch. We would fence 10 hours a day minimum. And he was already in his late 60s, mid to late 60s. And so the last thing I would do would be to say I was tired. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but I began with a man named Henry Hartunian here at, uh, who's the Yale Olympic fencing coach, uh, who I recently just went to say hello to again. And we went down to Michael Bennett's old studio at 890 Broadway. Uh, we got a room there. And he spent two months, the first month, only training me with my left hand. Uh, and, and I'm a righty. And he trained me like a ballet dancer. There's positions in fencing, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, et cetera. And then we went to the right hand later on, and then four months. So we filmed all the fencing sequences at the end of the film. But the actors did everything themselves except the flip in the air. Right. So I owe everything to those two men. And, and how long did it take to learn that Yiddish accent? That, uh, <clears throat> it, it, it's fun. I, I have great fun doing accents. I haven't done them for a while. But I, I, I love doing them because it, it's a wearing a mask. I, I think at times it's why I like singing, because it's, it's one step, you talk about reality stars or whatever, but it's one step away from reality. We're talking to each other now. But when we sing to each other, it's, it's yeah. 
normal, but it's unusual for our behavior. As, as a friend of mine said once, when he came to see a play I was doing by David Hare and Nick Bicat called The Knife at the public theater, we went out to eat afterwards, and, and uh, he had nothing to say after this production, and we were eating, and about 30 minutes into the meal, he said, Mandy, could you pass the ketchup, please? <laughs> And I guess that was his comment on uh, how he felt about the evening all being sung. Uh, but for accents, what I'd always done, both for Ragtime and, and The Princess Bride, is they, I think there are studies also with children that children hear a woman's voice better, as do I. Uh, so, particularly my wife's. Uh, and... I, I, what I would do for these accents, same thing I did for Tata and Ragtime, I search, I, I, I search out people that speak the language. But for The Princess Bride, I went with my friend Janet Schenk, and we went to Spanish embassies and then Spanish restaurants, and we found some restaurants. And we found uh, a woman who spoke Spanish, but, but she spoke the language from the script in Spanish to the lady we were with. And the lady then brought it back in English, in broken English, and made certain mistakes and errors. And so I would listen to these tapes, both for Inigo Montoya and The Princess Bride and, until I got it. And, and I remember with, with uh, Tata in, in, uh, in, uh, Ragtime. in Ragtime, thank you, uh, Michael Weller wrote the screenplay and Milos wanted me to get this accent and it was a, new, it was a physicist from Russia who was driving a cab, not a woman. And my interpreter gave him the script in Russian <laughs> and then he would give it back. So there was one line I'll never forget that was, um, the line written was, uh, absolutely I could do that if you'd like. And, and the man heard the line in Russian and repeated it in English and he said, I can do this once more. I can do everything what do your heart desire. <laughs> And I, it's a perfect translation. I showed that to Milos and to Michael Weller, and they just wrote it that in the <laughs> Congratulations with Homeland. Thank uh, you. It is... Uh, Thank you. <laughs> it, uh, it has definitely captured very much the attention. It won this Golden Globe, of course, most recently for Best New Drama. And I must say, I don't know if anyone watched the Golden Globes. When Claire Danes won, uh, you were really excited. Uh, I was. And I, I, you know, there was a real, you were so clearly, genuinely happy for her. Is this, is she the new Patti Lapone for you? Uh, well, I've been so blessed with the, the people I've been given, allowed to work with. It's just overwhelming. And I'm very moved by Claire. Uh, I mean, I could almost cry now. She gives herself, in a way, to this material. She's like a child uh, that never got jaded. Her humility is overwhelming. Her gift is astounding to me. I watch it like it's a magic trick. I don't know how she believes in the way she believes. And I'm very moved by her. And she's a great teacher to me. I, my teachers today are people like Claire, my children who are about her age, just a touch younger. And they are my teachers. And, uh, and I watch them like a hawk. It's funny what you said about her being roughly your children's age, because that relationship with Claire uh, uh, um, and the Saul character yes. uh, is is interesting. It's a it's a complicated relationship, and I guess we're all very interested to see how it plays itself out next year. Hmm. But let let's talk a little about the what I would say the politics behind the show. Hmm. Uh, you're well known for supporting a number of charities that make this particular role for you interesting. Uh, you support Peace Now in Israel. Uh, you support the, the September 11th Fund. Uh, you support, uh, I think it's PAX, which is an mm -hmm. anti-gun organization. Uh, is your personal politics at all involved in this character of Saul? I know that they didn't necessarily write the whole show for you, but this is clearly a blue state 24. Uh, this is not, this is a show about the war on terrorism, but very nuanced uh, and complicated and, and confusing. And I wonder whether this appeals to you in some sort of philosophical and political way that, it, that you're responding to as well. Hmm. 
Very much so. Um, when I met my wife, Catherine Grody, uh, her parents had passed away at the same time my father had passed away in 1972. Her parents within six months of each other at the same time my dad died. So we never met, I never met her parents, she never met my dad. So when I fell in love with her, I had to be approved of. And I was brought to two of her parental figures at the time, dear friends of hers, but she made all of her friends family. And these two people were Janet and Martin Sheen. And years later, we were at uh, popovers on Amsterdam having a meal and with the strawberry butter on the popover. <laughs> and at one point I said, well, I'm not that political. I really have learned everything from Catherine, my wife. I, I didn't, she said to me when we were meeting, what were your parents, Republicans or Democrats? I grew up in the synagogue on the south side of Chicago, just a couple blocks from where Barack Obama now lives when he's not at the White House. And, uh, and I responded to her when she said, are they Republicans or Democrats? And I said, I don't know, they were sisterhood in men's club. <laughs> that was the political party that I was familiar with. And so I said this to Mart, and, and I said, I don't know if I'm that political. And he said, Mandy, do you breathe? And I said, yes. He said, well, the air you breathe is political. And the other moment of my, of my political awakening was when I was doing the movie Book of Daniel that Sid, dear Sidney Lumet directed. We're going to talk about that. And I didn't know how to get into this. I didn't have anyone to meet right off the bat that I knew could feed me with connecting. I, the key word in my life is to connect. Connect, George. Connect, that James Lapine wrote and Stephen Sondheim and James Peace Sunday in the Park with George. So if, if there was one, if there were, if there's something I'd love on my tombstone, it would be I tried to connect. And I was looking for these connections to how do I play um, uh, Julius Rosenberg. This figure right. that was based on Julius Rosenberg. And my wife introduced me to several people that she knew that grew up as red diaper babies, etc. And then she took a book off the shelf. And she started reading to me the letters that the sons had written. And it wasn't the letters that connected me. All of a sudden, my wife started weeping at what she was reading. And I saw how she was connected to something I knew nothing about and how a person could care so much about something that was so foreign to me. And that was it. That was the light switch for me. So my political education has been my wife to the three boys at our dinner table, my two sons, Isaac and Gideon, and myself, and everything she taught us around that table. When we would collect money after concerts or I would get involved in organizations, trust me, it wasn't because of my initial awareness. Everything without exception was because of what she brought to the dinner table and to our family. And that awareness has been embedded in my sons who now annihilate me if I do not attend to what matters uh, to the nth degree. So, so what does your wife think about counterterrorism? What does my wife think about counterterrorism? <laughs> well, I mean, it does seem, it's interesting. It's a, you know, this is a very nuanced, textured performance. And we are really being told, I think, in Homeland, that we're really not sure what is good and evil. Hmm. And that, that there's the, that, and that someone who may look like a terrorist may also be somebody who's just having a hard time reacclimating to the world. Mm. Well, first of all, if I might just disagree with you for a moment, I do not see it as a blue state piece. Okay, cool. I think, and my wife and I disagree on this, but I, I am not a fan of, of, uh, of documentaries even though I love many of them, but I find that they're manipulated by the documentarian no matter what. So I tried to interview, interview Thane, but he declined to be interviewed for this film. And so that's how it all goes. And at the end of the day, they manipulate and tell the story they want to tell, whoever's telling it, whatever side, right or left. 
And I really feel that when you're in the hands of a dramatist like Shakespeare or Sondheim or, or wonderful writers like Homeland, you have the opportunity, whether you succeed or fail, to do your research and to present both sides of the issue clearly and fully and allow them both to possibly win their points of view. Mm -hmm. Therefore, allowing the audience then to listen and think about what they think. And as my son so brilliantly said, Isaac, he loves this show and he is not a fan of television because he feels that it is asking questions in the way that he has never experienced questions being asked in almost any medium, let alone an entertainment medium like television. And those questions are, who are the terrorists? Who are the racists in this post 9-11 world? Who's responsible for the way we act and the way we feel? And, and where I feel the real gift of this show can always reach for, as I said to the writers, they said, you want to know what's going to happen? No, I said, I don't. I, I can't wait to get these scripts. They're so stunning what happens as I turn these final pages. And I said, the reason I don't want to know is I don't need to know whether you're going or intending to make me a bad guy or a good guy. Because whether I'm the bad guy or the good guy, I know that I will believe in what I'm doing is, the, is for the better good of all humanity. Whether you decide that I'm right, left, center, bad, good, ugly. My job as the actor is to believe one trillion percent in what I'm saying and what I'm doing. And so it doesn't matter. So it, no matter what I'm playing, as long as I'm doing that, if you end up making me the good guy, I'm still playing the right thing. And if I end up being the bad guy, I was still playing the right thing, which is to believe in my cause. Let's, we're gonna watch a clip from Homeland. This is the scene, <clears throat> let me set it up for you. Uh, it's the scene where they, I, they finally locate the, uh, the white American woman who had married one of the people from the sleeper cell. Mm. And they find her, and <clears throat> Saul is, is assigned the job to go get her, reclaim her. And they're driving back, and on their way, they make a detour. They wind up in Saul Berenson's hometown at what looks like a makeshift shul that has since been abandoned. So here's <clears throat> a scene from Homeland. That is just a dynamite scene, and it's, um, I think Dick Cheney would hate that scene. <clears throat> and I'll tell you why. Uh, because it does make you think that sometimes the pull to an ideology or a belief system is because you don't want to be alone. That, <clears throat> I think there's that scene where Brody says, at first he says, you know, I don't believe, I just wanted someone to talk to, right? The idea that it's, it could be more complicated than that. Uh, in this case, you have a, a Jewish American telling her that, you know, fitting in is hard. <laughs> And I want to be part of something, to be part of something larger than the self. And that some of this fanaticism is driven by that is a very scary thought. That it's really about disaffected people finding each other. And it's interesting that the Jew, Jewish character is, you know, the perpetual outsider is making this point, this oh. comment. It just seems, I, I was <clears throat> interested in thinking about that. This is, Saul's life isn't that much different. You grew up in a synagogue in the Midwest. You sang in shul, right? I mean, this is, uh, you know, that you have very much a Jewish American story in that way. It, as we walk down the road of our life, if we're lucky, my wife used to say when I first met her, it's not the in it, she was quoting something poem, I think. It's not at the inn at the end of the road that matters. It's the road. And she also, I'll just tell you, this is the other thing I carry in my wallet, which she had engraved on a, it's an E.E. E. Cummings poem, and it's on a piece this big that I carry in my wallet. And it says, to be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best night and day to make you everybody else means to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight and never stop fighting. So these are part of my prayers that I've picked up along with things in the synagogue, Hebrew prayers, words from Shakespeare, words from Sondheim, etc., that are part of my meditation, my prayers when I meditate, when I go on stage in front of a camera. 
Another moment that defined my existence was when I was working with my mentor, teacher, friend, Gerald Friedman, who now is the dean of the school, University of North Carolina School of the Arts. But at that time, he was teaching me at Juilliard. But not at that time. He was my teacher at Juilliard. That's how I met him. And then about, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, he asked me to do Enemy of the People at Williamstown. And he taught me a lesson in that piece. We sat around, Larry Pine, myself, the rest of the cast, and he said all, there were all these complicated ideas in this play that Ibsen wrote with just extraordinary intellectual, ideological complications of life. Trying to figure out what's what, who's what, who's saying what, who's who, where's who, where, where what are we doing? What are you after? And then he said, I think it's a play about a family, these two brothers and their desperate love for each other and their need to heal each other and connect to each other. That piece of information, Anne Frank's diary, these are my tools. So when I went down to Langley before I made the pilot of Homeland, they connected me with, with, with who is known as a real spook, is what they call them, CIA guys. This is not Gary Oldham. No. <laughs> but this was the real guy who was supposedly what my characters <laughs> modeled after, who was one of the heads of the Middle East CIA divisions. And we sat at the Ritz-Carlton across from Langley, and he was talking to me for a long time, and I like him a lot. And he'd tell me these things, and I'd look at him, and I'd say, you're lying. You're just lying to me. He said, no, I'm not. I said, who do you think you're talking to? I, I, this is my job to know when people are telling the truth. And it's your job to lie, and you're failing. And then we, got, we had some laughs, and then he said something about his daughters. I said, where are they? Here. And they're graduates, and one was in just finishing school, the other was a graduate. Can I meet them? And they came over, and the three of us, and I don't know where his wife was at the time, she wasn't home, but we had a family discussion about what it was like. And at that moment, even before we shot the pilot, as I shared with the writers, and we totally agreed, they came out at one point because there was a discussion, does Sal have a child? And, the, and yes, he has a child, it's Carrie. Right. It's Claire's character as his child. And then it just became so crystal clear to me that the whole piece, to me, is about a family. It's, it's about different children and different possibilities that occur. Uh, one member of the family is Claire, the character who he's his child and he's also the boss and mentor of that I'm sure he recruited at Yale or wherever she was from. And another character that comes along are the, are the people he works with, members of that family, the CIA, David Harewood's character at the CIA, and the vice president and the judge who is corrupted. These are all members of his family, people he's come in contact with, people he's connected to in his life. And, and a third character I realize is our country and all of the children that live in our country and the world's country, all humanity that are responsible for hopefully this savant-like creature named uh, Carrie, uh, Claire, Carrie is the character's right. name that, she, that Claire plays, who has this gift for finding the truth, this savant-like quality that nobody can quite understand. Just call it lucky, and he knows it, and he believes that this young lady will save human lives, one. I love the Torah. Save one, you save the world. And that runs my life. And, and then it, one day I realized as he starts to meet the character of Brody and, and begins to understand some of the possibilities and the philosophies that exist on this supposed polar opposite individual, that's another child to him. Hmm. And so my, and, and as, as is uh, Marin's character right. Right. in this piece you just showed, and that makes my job easy when everyone I meet are, are possible children to this family. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so there, there seems to be uh, a kind of uh, uh, archetypal Mandy Patinkin character. Uh, brainy, Jewish, complicated, difficult, Jewish, 
brainy. <laughs> Uh, Sarat was Jewish. Right, exactly. We all, the, all the Jews. In Inigo Montoya was Jewish. I said he had a Yiddish accent. I knew. They were all circumcised. I looked. <laughs> well, you know, we don't let Gentiles sit in that chair. It's the 92nd Street Y. Uh, Is that true? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so your agent probably gets these calls all the time. You know, all, a lot of these characters, they, they call for you. There's a certain guy, and you're getting them. Uh, you know, Jeffrey Geiger, very complicated character. Jason Gideon. Uh, you know, I'm wondering whether this is becoming your domain, a, a certain character that we can envision by the way, I, I'm, I hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about, you mentioned the Diary of Anne Frank. Before mm. we shove off today, I want to talk about this play that you've been working on, Compulsion, that's appeared in Berkeley and in Yale and here in the public. And we hope to do it in Israel. I, I, th I would love to see a much longer run of the play, because there, yet to me, the character of Meyer Levin, who we might get a chance to talk about, is a classic Mandy Patinkin character in my view. So are you working this particular character? Is this who you are, or is it... Not at all. Okay, let's hear this. Well, I would say who I am is a, is a fragile fellow uh, whose most of his life was ruled by fear. And <laughs> at some point in my life, through friends and teachers and luck, I learned to manage this fear, welcome this fear, realize I couldn't live without this fear, and that indeed part of it is you wouldn't know how to run from a burning building without it, but it, at other moments it's not so friendly, but you can't chase it away. So I was attracted to parts, uh, and I love the theater also. Uh, I love writing, I love the theater, I love songs, I love the structure of a defined personality, so I don't have to figure out who I am. I can figure out who they are. And then I can feed whatever I know about life into it and whatever I wish for myself and for the world into it. And I can hide it underneath the words of whoever wrote what I'm saying or singing. I could just ride underneath it. And, uh, and, and when I learned to welcome this fear, to realize that it was actually one of the great gifts of my life, fear, because the, the way I've learned to breathe with it is, is to um, understand that there's no way I can run from it. It's much faster and much smarter than I am. It's primitive and monster-like, but primitive most of all. It will, it will, it's always been a part of me and will never not be a part of me. So I welcome it. And I all, at a concert or in front of the camera, I ask it to pull up a chair right next to me or sit right on my shoulder. And I want to give it a free ticket to everything I'm at uh, because it, it has taught me to try. The only way I know to counter it is to try to infuse into it hope and optimism. And my teachers have taught me that, and I practice it like a meditation, and I look for songs that sing this meditation, and parts that play these ideas, and writers who write it, like David Kelly, like Howard Gordon and, and Alex Gonza from Homeland, like Stephen Sondheim, who, like William Shakespeare. You know, Shakespeare and Sondheim, these are dark souls. You know, so are you a dark soul, Mandy? Yeah, okay, do you like being a dark soul? Fuck no. <laughs> what do you do about it? I try to attach myself to individuals and material that fight the darkness. And everything that Stephen Sondheim and William Shakespeare, in my opinion, write, is about turning darkness into light. And everything that I try to do, even when I fail, is that. And so that's what my life's about. Good. <clears throat> You've had a, a, a reputation of creating characters, making them fully developed, certainly on television, making you utterly irreplaceable, and then you leave. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm sorry for Joe Montagna on this one, because uh, we definitely miss 
Jason Gideon. Uh, there, was, there was some speculation that you left Criminal Minds because it was just too dark and violent. Is there some truth to that, that that alone, the, you know, these dark plot lines with the most loathsome characters on Earth? Can you just tell us briefly, uh, if you wish, uh, why did you leave that show? We know that you left uh, Chicago Hope. You wanted to spend more time with your family. Yes. But you had just won an Emmy. You yes. just, you were rolling. I decided to leave before I won the Emmy. Would you have not if you had won the Emmy? No, they tried to talk me into saying after I'd won the Emmy with a lot of... Did they say, you just won the Emmy? Yeah, oh, no question. <laughs> they said, if you leave, you may not win the Emmy. And then when I won the Emmy, you know, all kinds of uh, promises and, you know, little carrots were put in front of me. So, I, I so wanted to be with my family. Criminal Minds? Uh, I, I made a mistake. And I'll tell you what the mistake was. I've never spoken about it publicly uh, other than little snippets in interviews. The mistake was my fear. I was always worried about money, which I'd never in my whole career have ever had to worry about. But I was brought up to worry about it, even if you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and I guess that's what runs greed all over the world. No matter how much is enough, it's never enough. So let's keep worrying and worrying and worrying and making all kinds of mistakes because of it. And I certainly made mine. That was part of the mistake. The other part was I didn't pay attention to the material because once you get yourself locked on to one need that you think you have, which was the security of the job mm -hmm. and having the job to go to every day, which I love, and the economic false security because I wasn't in trouble. I was doing fine. I ignored the fact that there was a woman in a cage being tortured. I thought, well, this is just the pilot. You can't do that every show, for God's sake. <laughs> How long would that be interesting? Yet it remained interesting for now, I think, seven or eight years they're into. And, and, and the way I work is I infuse my own reality underneath what I'm saying. There are actors, if you read Rosemary Tischler's book about actors in interviews, it's extraordinary. I read some of these interviews about how actors like Claire, I don't know what Claire's process is, but other people, they just believe so thoroughly. I can't believe it. I can't believe what I'm saying in these scenes. If you just say, to I don't, I tried, I don't, it doesn't work for me. So I have to find my own story to live underneath it that absolutely matches and connects to what the words that the writer wrote, that mirror it, that metaphor it, that work for me, that connect me to it. And, uh, and in the case of Criminal Minds and these horrific misogynistic tales told over and over again in the torture of women and children, where I had to go mentally were beyond darkness. To be there 16 hours a day to stay alive and connect. And I, I don't care whether I'm playing Hamlet or Gideon in Criminal Minds, I go about it the same way. And 16 hours a day, nine and a half months a year, was, was destroying my heart and soul. It was very, very destructive to me and made me very sad. And there were scripts that came to me that I voiced disapproval of. I spoke to the studio, the network. I couldn't believe that certain people would accept that this would go out there. And I began to feel ill about being a part of a, a world, now it is a world bedtime story, which the last thing that people watch before they go to bed. And it's married to fear, in fairness to it, and part of the theory of the success of these shows, in my opinion, and in some great psychologists' opinions, is the fear factor. And part of why I think people might remain addicted to it is there is a theory that if you, con you know, there but for the grace of God go I. So if you drink your cup of fear every day, it won't happen to you. Well, maybe true, but I can't participate in it anymore. And as it turns out, you know, good luck, Mandy, because uh, the first two years, there's 48 episodes and they're rerunning them all over the world nonstop. Uh, you know, yes, I get paid for it. I'm glad I got the money. I'm not going to lie about it, but I, I'm not proud of it. And I needed to leave for to save my life. Hmm. Wow. <clears throat> and and I, and I want to just add, most importantly, that's how I feel. I have good friends in that show, and I meet people all over the world who love that show. 
And they, and I'm not here to tell them that they're wrong for how they feel. It's how I feel. It's how it affects me. And it's a private matter for me, and everybody's entitled to their own experience. <clears throat> now to leave the world of utter darkness and to move to another world, a, a lost world of the Jewish shtetl in Poland. Uh, let's, let's, let's take a, a look at a clip from Yentl. This is the, <clears throat> this is the, I guess the penultimate scene when Avigdor actually discovers that his best friend Yentl is a girl. <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's almost 30 years ago. What does that make you think when you see that scene? Oh, that I had the wisdom that I have today when I was that young man. <laughs> I, um, it's, a hard, it's a wild thing watching yourself documented like this. Uh, Sorry. So many years later, it's a bizarre, unusual thing <laughs> because whew, I'm not interested in the scene I remember everything that happened that day around it, that week, that month. My son was born. I remember it in, in London, and we had to get to Prague where we were shooting, and my baby was, had jaundice, and I had to fly a moil over there. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, it was an amazing time in our lives, and, uh, and everything about it was... Uh, the beginning of, of the beginning of our new life, as my dear friend said to me, it, it was the third stage of his marriage when our children were born. And, uh, and that was the beginning of our third marriage with one woman, the birth of our children. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't know, what else? Um, there, there are people who wonder, myself, one, one, surely one of them, um, had there been some consideration to letting you, giving you a song for the soundtrack? Hmm. You had already won a Tony for yeah. playing Che in, in Avita. Uh, everyone had well aware of your singing talents. Um, was that something presented to you? Is something that you asked for? I was praying for it. I, I consider Barbara one of the greatest talents who ever to have lived and still alive, thank God. And uh, I love singing more than I love anything other than my wife and children. And I wanted to sing with the greatest living singer as far as I was concerned, and there I was in the room with her while... And I was singing parts of the Torah that I was learning in one scene in the wagon and was praying that I would get to sing. But it wasn't in the conceit of the piece. The piece was designed... Uh, by a variety of people and, and certainly with Barbara's leadership that the, th the sung thoughts would be her personal thoughts. Right. So as, as my, one of my dear friends at the time said to me when it became clear I wasn't going to sing, he said, so you don't think? And, uh, <laughs> and I, you know, I wish I could have uh, presented that possibility or had the skill to suggest it in a way. I didn't say anything. I was hurt at the time and sad. I, I just was devastated by the fact that I wasn't going to get to sing with this person and I'm sad to this day. I'm over it, but I'm, I'm, I'm sad about it because uh, you don't, uh, it doesn't get better than her. So I, I just wish that I got to think as much as she did or just even a little bit. <clears throat> you know, uh, something we take for granted if that was purely authentic, both of those characters would have been speaking in Yiddish. Yeah. Um, you were playing a character uh, written by what many people believe is the greatest Yiddish uh, uh, fiction writer of his time or any generation, won a Nobel Prize for it, Isaac Besheva Singer, uh, who created the characters of Yentl and Avigdor. Um, and then 10 years later, you actually put out a record of Yiddish songs. Uh, what was, for Mamaloshin, what was the inspiration for that? What motivated you? Was it to preserve a dead language? Was it because you thought the melodies were beautiful and you wanted to record them? It was my dearest friend, Joe Papp. Uh, Joe, who signed the ketubah at our wedding, 
called me up one day, and he was very much like my dad, and, uh, and he said, uh, we're doing a benefit for the Evo Foundation at the Schubert Theater. I need you to sing a Yiddish song for me. I said, I don't know any. I knew a few lines of one that my dad used to sing, Yome Yome. And he said, you don't know any. It's about time you learned one. Okay, I said, I'm sending you over one. And Joe, who had a very healthy ego, to say the least, sent me over a Yiddish song called Yossel Yossel, which means Joseph Joseph. <laughs> <coughs> and I learned this song, and I sang it at the Schubert Theater after a, a video was shown. I stood behind the screen uh, uh, backstage. They showed a video that someone put together of Joe's life in the, sh in the where he was family was from, from the shtetl, et cetera. And, uh, and then I, the uh, curtain went away, and I came out, and I sang Yussel Yussel. And I had, it, it, up to that time, I had been in a number of shows from the time I was in, uh, started in high school, musicals, and then in New York musicals, and I'd sung a lot of show tunes, sung a lot of American popular music, but this hit me in a way that I just couldn't believe. And, and then, uh, I wanted to work on it, and he came over for a Shabbos dinner one night, sometime after it, and, and I had recorded Yossel Yossel with Don Byron for one of my mm -hmm. albums, who uh, loved Mickey Katz, and he played Yossel like nobody's business. And we had a great time, and I played it for Joe, the rough cut, and he looked at me on the couch in my studio before we sat down at the dinner table, and he said, this is your job. You have to learn this music and pass it on. You've been given the ability to sing, and this is your job. And I heard him, and I, a few years, after, not very long after, I was in, I think, Boston, and my dear friend uh, and, and, uh, and collaborator, Bob Hurwitz, from None Such Records, came to talk to me about recording. And I'll never forget, we sat in the hotel room and he said, I do not think, but I'd made a couple of records and, uh, of my own by that point and some show records, he said, but I do not think you have anywhere near, you have made a, an album yet that you can't, that you could make. I think you can do better, is what he was trying to say to me in, in a far more articulate fashion than I'm saying now. And what do you want to do? And I had this idea and that idea, but I said, which I thought he'd laugh and walk out of the room, you know, a guy who runs a big record company. And I said, I'd like to make this Yiddish record. I'd like to do some Yiddish. And he said, fine, that's your first record. That'll be your first record. And I didn't have the guts for it to be my first record, so I think it was the second. But he <laughs> championed it. And I have to tell you, there are helpers out there that we don't know about. I'm, I'm, we, we made it with the same musicians that we made all the other CDs with, uh, greatest musicians in New York at the same studio. Uh, I, I, was, I never like people nudging me when I'm recording, except Bob can come up and talk to me, and the conductor, Paul Ford, my piano player. But this was the most complicated recording of any that I'd ever done. Uh, we had a separate language. I was coached by a lot of people. I had coaches sitting in the recording booth to make sure that the words were dead on, that I didn't make a mistake. The orchestrations, the orchestra, the clock is ticking, the money's rolling, etc. And, and it went smoother than any other record I'd ever made. And at the end of it, in the studio, the African-American and Asian musicians came up to me who had been on every other CD we'd made and said, we have to just tell you something. And the whole thing sung in Yiddish. We've been on every one of your CDs, and we can't tell you why, but this was the most powerful experience of any of the experiences we've had recording your music. And I wondered, I didn't know why. And, and at some point after we started performing it, once I figured out how to perform it, and, and, and priests and nuns and lots of non-Jews would come to hear it, I realized, at least I, I think I have an answer why I loved it and why other people connected to this language they didn't understand. If I may, may I say. And uh, Richard Avedon took the photograph for the cover, which, which he wanted to do again. 
and then we put it in front of an American flag because I felt that it, it was a story of an immigrant. And it just happened to be a Jewish immigrant because that's what I come from. That's why I'm here. And, and as these other people would come to the dressing room after a performance of it and say how it affected them, I realized that the lesson of this album and these African-American musicians and Asian musicians, I realized that the lesson of this journey was whatever you come from, whether it's Russian or Polish or German or Haitian or African or, or Jewish, or whatever your background is, just simply take a bath in your history, in the sounds of your history, the smells of your history, the tastes of your history, of your ancestry. You don't need to understand it. It's a little like love. Just walk into it, let it wash over you. Don't think about it. And I think there's something that we don't understand, uh, coupled with the music, that is probably one of the most powerful communicators, just sounds of music that affects us. And so that was the gift to me of, of that accident. So, so if I were to ask you to sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game in Yiddish, <coughs> would I strike out? Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So once you're treated to one Mandy Patinkin song, there's I'd got, like to give you a couple hours. There's, no. there's, <laughs> there's got to be more, and we're gonna we're gonna listen to a, a really interesting duet with Mandy and Madonna. Yes, the the Madonna from yesterday Super Bowl. <laughs> that woman actually continued on after this performance but you're gonna see a younger Madonna and you're gonna see a, a younger Mandy playing the part of 88 Keys. What's interesting about this duet, it's a Sondheim song. Yes. Sondheim wrote a, a number of original songs for this movie. Yes. Which, no doubt, there was one reason why surely you needed to be cast uh, as 88 Keys, but you're gonna see, a, and I love this song, by the way, and I wanna hear what you think about it, but this is a duet with Mandy and Madonna from Dick Tracy. I love that. I, I really enjoyed listening to that again. What is it about your voice, which we know is very unusual and special, that is particularly in sync for Sondheim? Um, you are considered one of the world's great interpreters of Sondheim's catalog. That song alone just seems that I can't think of another man who could do that. Uh, it's just a vocal range that's astonishing. Um, tell us about your voice and about how it merges, melds, uh, with, uh, with Sondheim. Well, let me just back up a second and thank Warren. I was playing, I was playing Leontes in Shakespeare's Winter's Tale at the Public Theater James Lapine's production that Joe asked me to do. At the same time, I wanted to start trying to do concerts. Uh, it was 1980, oh, I think, eight or nine or seven, I can't remember. And everybody told me, if you're going to do concerts or sing, you're from Broadway, so you need a big orchestra and you need to wear a tuxedo and you need dancing girls and all this. And I said, I can't do that. And it would cost like fifty, sixty, dollars $100,000. I said, I can't do any of that. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And uh, everybody said, that's how you had to do it. And Joe said, well, you didn't ask me. I said, he said, if you play Leontes eight times a week at the Public Theater in the Anspacher, you'll have six Monday nights off. And on those six Monday nights, you can try your little music thing. <laughs> so the first Monday night came, and I'll never forget, he sent me some flowers, and I put them in two coffee cans, and I brought them out on stage. And for 24 years, I've never walked out on stage without those coffee cans to bring Joe with me. And he put his hands on my shoulders after that first concert in the Anspacher on the set where we were doing Shakespeare's Winter's Tale. 
on the first Monday night, and he looked at me in the mirror. And I'll never forget, I'm looking in the mirror, and he's behind me looking at me in the mirror, and he said, well, I guess you like doing that. And, and then he said to me, you're going to always have to remember that you're going to need to do both. Hmm. You're going to need to sing and do the classics to feel like a whole person. And I let that ball drop for a while, but he, he, was, he was great. And I was there for a long time working for nothing. And so I had no money. And I called Warren. I'd run on, you know, your career's show business. So I did some art for a while. Uh, and uh, real art, you know, that doesn't pay any money. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I called a bunch of friends, and Warren was one of them. And I said... I'll do anything. I just need to pay the rent. I'll, you know, can you, anything you're doing, if you're making a movie or you know somebody making a movie, can I serve a drink or be a waiter? Or just so I can, you know, get, I just need to make the dough for the rent because I've been working for nothing. And the next thing I knew, Warren had called Sondheim and said, could you write Mandy a song? And I want it to be in this range. And, and this is what I want it to be about. So that, I wanted to say that. Now, what was the question you asked me? <laughs> Well, Sondheim, who you've described in the same sentence as Shakespeare, is someone who you are very well known as being one of his great interpreters. And it does seem that there is a, a mind meld here between your vocal range and his uh, lyricism and music and compositions. Uh, what, what is that connection? Hmm. You said everything is connection for you. Yeah. This is obviously one of them. You know, Sunday in the Park with George is an iconic role uh, for you. Uh, as both Surratt and Surratt's legacy. Mm. And, uh, you know, what we just saw at Dick Tracy is a really good example of something that looks as if it really was written for you. It was. That one was. Uh, that's the only one I think that ever was. Ever. Um, just to back up a hair, I'd just done Evita, and I won the Tony Award for it. And auditioning was a nervous wreck experience for me. Now I won the Tony Award, and I thought, well, maybe that'll make something easier. And five minutes after I won it, Lapine comes over to my house, James, and says, we've written this new piece, and I'd love you to look at it, think about it, playing George Seurat. And it's a, we wanted to make a piece, of, we wanted to make a work of art based on a work of art. Okay. And then the next thing he says to me before he leaves is, and you have to audition. And I went, what? <laughs> what? What do you got to do in this world? I just won what they call is like this big award. It's a Tony Award. I'm a nervous wreck of a person. I'm not going to be able to stand in front of Steve Sondheim and sing. It's a losing battle. <laughs> I've, no, and he said, look, just talk to him on the phone. So we put Steve on the phone. And I'll never forget, he said, everybody auditions for me except Angela. And she used to, but Angela doesn't have to because we worked together so many times. So don't worry about it. Okay. Then the next thing I hear from Paul Gemignani or somebody else, that the only song he's written for George, the character I played, up to that point before the workshop at Playwrights Horizon, was a part of Color and Light. But he'd written it for a baritone, I'd heard, because I'd heard, quote, unquote, he and you'd have to ask Steve if this is true. This is what I'd heard secondhand. Because, quote, unquote, he hates tenors. So now I'm going to audition. I'm a nervous wreck to audition for a guy who I already know hates the way I sing. And he's never met me. So I go in and Paul Gemignani, who's this glorious, wonderful conductor, works me through the audition and you know, changes the keys and does all this stuff. So initially, it was written for a baritone, not for me. He jerry-rigged certain things you know, later after the fact, but then wrote the rest of it you know, once he knew my range. And, uh, and, and so the, the quality of my voice, uh, my instrument, and, and Steve have nothing to do with each other. I believe our connection is our lyrical connection. <coughs> and as I said earlier, it's the connection of turning, and, and I'm not speaking for him, I'm speaking for me. I believe it's the connection that we, if I could write, I would write what he writes uh, lyrically. And musically, too, because I've never, re I've never read or sung or heard a lyric that was of quality that I didn't feel the music supported equally. And he is about writing, turning darkness into light, which is exactly the prescription I need to breathe. And so that's what it is for me. And that's why I, uh, you know, I, 
I just, I can't get over that the guy's a friend of mine, that uh, we know each other, <laughs> that if I'm working on a project, I can get him on the phone, that he can even, is willing to make adjustments for certain things, that he gives me notes, uh, you know, it, 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 no matter when along the road it is, he never stops working and caring about the quality of the material. And that I always wondered, what's it like working in Shakespeare's time? You know, what were those actors like? What was that company like? Well, I know what it's like. It's like, you know, Steve, and you get you on the phone, and you audition, and you work your butt off, and that's what it's like, and it's just incredible. I can't believe it. I want to, <clears throat> one really brief question about Madonna. Um, so <laughs> the audience must, must know what I want to know. Um, so did you get her into the Kabbalah? What the hell happened? Like, is this your fault, this Mishigas with her? I mean, you you're know, sitting I, with her at the piano bar and you mentioned Jewish mysticism and she's off to the races? Honestly, God, I, I tell you, I, I'm, I, I, I don't know. Well, I, I, you know, we finished recording. Everything's pre-recorded in a movie. So she and I are alone there for God knows how long in the studio. And we finished recording. And I said, you wanna, can I take you out to dinner? And she said, no. <laughs> okay, I don't know what she was thinking I was thinking, but I just wanted to take her out to dinner. And, and just chat, and I had a nice time with her. And not that long after, Warren wanted to rehearse. So we were gonna meet at her house with Pacino and Warren and myself. And she was getting her roots dyed. While I got there, I was the first one to get there, I was a little early. And she get, was getting her roots dyed for this platinum blonde deal she was doing. And, uh, and they were late. And while I was sitting there, watching her get her roots dyed, she said, well, what are you going to do? So, uh, she had, was it that, was it before? It was after, no, she hadn't heard, heard the singing. She hadn't heard me sing yet. It was just after the public theater, and I was debating whether or not to go to the Helen Hayes or to do my one-man music show. I was debating it. And she gave me her philosophy, so I shared this with her. And she said, well, you have to make it an event. What do you mean, I said. An event. It has to be a big event. And she gave me her philosophy in a very concise fashion that I wish I'd had a tape recorder going, which was a brilliant philosophy. It was her philosophy to the T about how she maneuvers, manages, manipulates, and, and, in, and enhances and artistically designs her, con her con total control and approach to whatever she's going to present. And when she finished speaking, at that moment I realized that she was going that way and I was going that way. <laughs> and no human being on earth could have ever articulated a complete antithesis to who I was. <laughs> and it was a very helpful moment because it was so clear that I knew if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do everything the opposite of what she just <laughs> described. So let me, let's talk about another one of your female friends, Patti LuPone. Uh, you just did this really <laughs> wonderful Broadway uh, show, which you, in fact, wrote, and you uh, organized the material. That's all your, your curation of music with you and, and Patti Lapone. And if you hadn't seen it on Broadway, it was truly miraculous. It was lovely, and the choice of the songs were... But I, I just want to briefly, because I want to move on, and we're going to have to take some questions from our audience, and I want to watch a little scene from Daniel. There is a really great anecdote that you told with her on stage in Act Two, uh, and I'm, I'm going to tell it quickly. Quickly, uh, it's when you and your wife went to the West End of London and to hear Patti Lapone uh, play Fantine in Les Misérables, and so when she sings "I Dream a Dream," uh, Mandy apparently is shaken with emotion, and his wife Catherine, who we've heard about says to him, so what's, what's going on? I mean, you know, you're a pro, you see these things all the time. And he looks her in the face and he says, this is as good as it gets. And it, you were crying, that there was a sense of this musical connection. I think that it was very revealing and telling about what moves you and what motivates you and what that bond was <laughs> with Lupone. And I just wanted to share an anecdote quickly. Um, uh, you made two films. Can, can I just say yes, one yes, little please, thing about what you're saying? Please. Oh, I forgot what <laughs> I wanted to say about that. Wait, wait, hold no, go ahead, please. Let me hold your thing. Yeah, yeah. You know what, what, I forgot, I buried the lead. Here, you know what was great about that? When I sat in the Broadway theater and heard that, here's what I thought. Uh, I don't know if you're Chicago Hope fans, 
but at the end, somewhere in the middle of the end of that season, for which Mandy wins uh, an Emmy Award, uh, he, uh, when we learn that Jeffrey Geiger's wife is in a mental institution, this, uh, if, I don't know how many of you will remember this, but it is just devastating. <laughs> he sits, he visits his wife in the mental institution. She's in a catatonic state. And he sits at the piano and he sings, I dreamed a dream. Now, I wanted to show that to you. It's not available in DVD. But if there was ever a reason to protest to get a DVD, that's the reason. The song that moved him so from his friend, Patti Lapone, is a song that he sang for David Kelly's show, Chicago Hope. Now it's your turn. You know, what you, the, that you just told that is the reason I love the theater more than anything in the world. I have done, we, Patty and I have been doing this show on and off for the last four years intensely, about five years before, a little bit here and there, and we would change it. I only told that story one time, and you happen to be there. Oh my, I, that is shocking. Well, I've I only told it once, because I never know what I'm going to say usually, and, and I change it. Unbelievable. And I only told it once in my entire life with her. Unbelievable. Or, or anywhere on stage. And I, I love the theater because wow. you don't know who hears it or if it's ever meant anything to anybody. And, and, I, and, then, and then you tell it to these people and some other people are watching it somewhere. And, and, uh, and I'm happy it's because I, I didn't tell it after that night. And I probably won't. It's hard to believe. That's so <laughs> incredible that I was there that night. And it was so moving to hear and was so you know, demonstrative of this friendship. But more importantly, you know, the guy's a pro, right? And yet he was broken by this. It was just so overwhelming to hear. And, you know, I'm sure there's some Les Miserables fans here, but to hear that yeah. and that experience. So, and then you went ahead and years later did it. On, well, but on, it's not me that it's about, really. It is about Patty. And, and when you do love this form of musical theater the way I love it, and you see someone do what she does that is unexplainable, it just broke me down. And I, I remember looking at Catherine and... I just was in heaven, as I am every night I get to be up there with her. It really is one of those moments that I hope you find a way to do it in your life somehow, because I know everyone gets it, whether you, whatever you do in this world, in this life, you get moments when you're not paying attention, and you should be, because it's as good as you're going to get, maybe, for a long time until you get to hold your wife or your kid or your grandchild if you're lucky. And if, if there's something about the work you do or a moment, and you don't catch it while it's happening and say to yourself, look at where I am, look who I'm talking to, look who I'm sitting having dinner with, look at what I'm getting to do for this split second. Pay attention, because before you take your last breath and your eyes are in the, if you're lucky to see the light or whatever, you know, you want that to flash by, and you want to take a photograph of it. <laughs> I'm going to take a look at a clip from the movie Daniel. Um, a number of years ago, not many years ago, actually, three years ago, Mandy, uh, uh, Sidney Lumet was sitting in that chair. And uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if you went to the... Sydney, of course, died this past April. Um, did you go to the Lincoln Center, the memorial? Were you there? I was out of town. I spoke to Sydney very short. I was in Berkeley doing a compulsion, uh -huh. and I called him, and we were going to get together for dinner. And he didn't mention a word yeah, about he, his he didn't illness. Tell Not a word. And he sounded so great. And the next thing I know. I will tell you, so I was at the memorial, and there was this really, you've got to get this photograph if you don't have it. It's a photograph of Sydney directing you. And, you know, you're towering over the guy, all right? And you have this smile on and, you know, he's got his finger talking to you gently. You know how mm. you, he come close to you? Was it when I was with the little kid at the table, the cereal scene? No, 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 not then. no, okay. no. It's just, it's just you got to get this photograph. Okay, I don't and know. It, I was really moved by that. This is, um, uh, uh, ironically, uh, Mandy played two characters that were adapt adaptations from E.L. Doctorow novels, Tata in Ragtime and uh, Paul Isaacson, the Julius Rosenberg uh, stand-in uh, in Daniel. Uh, so... Uh, and Sidney Lumet directed Daniel, and this is just a really devastating scene, an incredible demonstrate, very moving. Uh, Mandy plays essentially Julius Rosenberg, whose son and daughter visit him uh, for the first time in a number of years, and will be the last time uh, that they will visit him because he will soon be executed. And this is a scene from, uh, from Daniel. In, in real life, of course, there were two sons. Uh, in the fictional story, there's a, a, a son and a daughter. And this is from Sidney Lumet's Daniel.
<laughs> Netflix that. Trust me, you should see that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> let's take some questions from the audience and then we'll say good night and thank Mandy. Uh, this is from uh, actually out here and from our audience here at the Kaufman Auditorium. <clears throat> Are your children, your sons, interested in living lives on stage or in music? Both of my sons are performers in their own way. <laughs> they do not like me talking about them very much, so I'm not going to get to say very much. Um, there is some public knowledge of my younger <laughs> son, Gideon, who is a singer and a songwriter. I'm not allowed to say what he's doing at the moment, but it's very exciting because <laughs> he doesn't want me to talk about it. Uh, interestingly enough, though, I will say he uses a different name than my last name because he very much wants to make sure that he is, uh, makes it without any connection, hmm. even though connect, connect is the word I love. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I get it, and I think it's quite thrilling. But he has uh, thrown the old man a bone. In the past year, he's done about 10 or 12 concerts with me where he sings my songs, uh, you know, show tunes, and I, I'm in heaven when I'm up there with him. Um, every bit is equal to being up there with Patty when, I get to be up, when you get to be up there with your kid. Um, and, but it is the furthest thing from what he does. He writes his own material and plays it, and, and he is uh, traveling in other parts of the world performing it right now, which is making us thrilled as his parents. And my older son is, uh, is a, uh, very much a political activist and a, uh, a sustainable activist for health care, for human rights, for people in this world who are underprivileged in what <clears throat> life has given them uh, or not given them in the case of not a good enough home, not health care, not, not hope in so many ways. And he is, his life is about trying to infuse hope and possibility and, and affordability in people's lives who, who just uh, are not so privileged, to say the least. And so he is so much a performer in the way he speaks to people and campaigns for um, the underdog. It's quite moving, and he is equally a teacher to me. <clears throat> uh, this comes from Rochester, New York. Uh, has your Jewish identity changed over time? It's gotten stronger and clearer. People used to say to me, well, what is your Jewish identity? It's two things that I really remember from listening to all the rabbi's sermons. Um, you know, it's not a joke. When I was a younger actor, I wanted to make sure that... Uh, I didn't want to get typecast as just the Jew. Uh, and so I played Surratt and I played Inigo Montoya. But then as I got, I don't know, somewhere in my 40s, I realized everybody I play is Jewish. <laughs> and, I, and then I said to myself, why? And I realized I heard echoes of the two key things, the nervous system of what I remember the rabbi speaking about always in his sermons. Rabbi Ralph Simon at Congregation wrote Fazedek on the south side of Chicago in Hyde Park right near the University of Chicago. And I was there for every Friday night because I was in the boys' choir and the family choir. I was there for every Shabbos. I was a member of junior congregation. I was the gabbai, et cetera. And he always talked about two aspects of what it was to be a Jew. One was uh, forgiveness. And I didn't understand it at the time. I didn't really realize that the hardest person to forgive was yourself, and, but to forgive anyone. Uh, and rachmonis, the, the word which means compassion. And, and I, I say, uh, in terms of my politics, my Israeli politics, my world politics, my human politics, for those of us that are privileged to be alive anywhere on this planet, uh, those who are not capable of forgiving themselves because of the pain they've suffered uh, from violence, whether they be Palestinians, just if we take the Middle East and Israel Palestinians, whether they be Palestinian individuals that have suffered great loss and pain, or Israelis, or Americans, or Jews, or anyone anywhere in the world that has suffered pain. If you can't, rec and there are many stories of great people that have overcome it, and sit at the peace table and make examples of how, how we forgive, and how we have compassion in spite of the horrors that have taken place in the past, for their hope for humanity for the future. I deeply believe that it is our job, all of us who are still breathing and walking and talking, to find some way in our work, our music, our lives, the conversations we have somewhere, some corner of our life, to 
constantly strive to find a way to get people or to sit down with people at any peace table you can think of, your own dinner table, a conversation here, anywhere you go, to never let go of the possibility of keeping that discussion alive to make peace happen in the Middle East and let it grow all over the world. It is our job to have the strength for those human beings who do not have the strength to recover from the horrors they've witnessed. We, some of us, have been blessed that we haven't had that direct horror in our life, and we have just that little extra strength to sit there for everyone who can't, and that's our job. Like Joe said, like Joe said to me one day, it's my job to learn Yiddish. It's our job for all human beings, not just you Jews, to find a way to make people never give up and never give up hope to stop, to try to find peace in the Middle East. <clears throat> Mandy, before we say goodnight to you and thank you, I, was, um, I had read that you actually love and collect uh, model trains. Yes. Uh, and I thought, what a great hobby for you. <laughs> um, model trains are all about locomotion, forward movement. And that is very much your career. And we wish you the best of luck, and we want you to keep moving. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy Patinkin. Thank you.